Greetings yet again. Uh, I think I wanted to do an off-the-cuff response to my own video just to explore or go a little bit more in depth about this whole idea of free will determinism. And I want to talk a little about so-called utilitarian arguments. Now, I'm kind of just doing this for myself. I know most people aren't interested in this, but so be it. So the reason why I had that snippet of Sam Harris talking about free will in the video is because I, I was trying to demonstrate a point, well, several points, but I talked about sort of biological trajectories and how we sort of follow along these lines, whether it comes to our you know, nutritional habits, metabolism, reproductive habits, and so on and so forth. And that's part of what's essentially a deterministic worldview. But, you know, when you talk about free will, uh, this seems to uh, bring about a lot of uh, people being upset. Now, people, some people, or people in general, may or may not have under understood what he said. Uh, I'm going to put it in a different way that might be a little more clear. So, even without detailed scientific knowledge, it's, it's pretty easy to ascertain that we don't have this thing called free will. Uh, that, for example, we are essentially not a, a self, but the sum of many, many different physical processes and components. But we still have this idea because of uh, the, our cognitive functions of a kind of a self, of an I, a person who makes choices of, and that we're free to choose anytime we want to do one thing or the other. Now, this, when you really think about it, it's just it's patently false. I mean, it, it but it's, it's a thought that we entertain, uh, I think, for a lot of reasons. A lot of it might be <laughs> human beings' desire to, well, or inclination to engage in wishful thinking, then... Uh, it seems that way, doesn't it? It really does seem that way. But, on face value. But if you examine the issue, it's, it's very clear that th this is not the case. Uh, and we will talk about the consequences that, of that a little bit later. So, how can you tell that you don't have free will? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, you have to look at the fact that you are um, the sum of, as I said, various physical components and processes going on uh, in your body, but also in the external world, a stream of causes of which you are not aware. And those are the terms that Sam Harris uses. But what does that really mean? And in the, in the video, I say, you know, you are your brain. We are our brains. Uh, well, for one thing, before going into that, you can think of it in this way. I mean, did you choose to be born? I mean, the fact of your birth was uh, the result of processes outside of your control and outside of, uh, of your ability to choose. Now, let's fast forward a couple of years when you were one or two, you were rolling about in a cradle or uh, you know, crying to get attention to gain access to sustenance or whatever. I mean, it's highly doubtful you have recollect recollections of that to begin with. But even so, did you choose to do that? I mean, when you were a one-year-old, did you choose to roll over on your left side as opposed to your right? Did you choose to raise your uh, your right hand as opposed to your left? Uh, or does, does free will only enter into... Uh, the equation when you become an ad adult or a, or a teenager, you know, there's a lot of there are a lot of reasons as to why this should be doubted that we have free will. Those are just a few of them, uh, but we, we feel like we're in charge very much so, and we feel like we're the, we're that person. I mean, for example, you know, when you were that one year old, that and you're the person you are now. That's the same person, right? But in fact, you're not. Uh, we, our memories are flawed. We don't re recall things correctly often. And more to the point, uh, we've matured. But what's really interesting is on a molecular le le level and even on an atomic level, we're, we are not the same people we used to be. 
uh, we have this, you know, Stardust is not the same Stardust. The Stardust of today is not the same Stardust of three or four years ago and not the same as th 13 and not the same as, uh, you know, 35 years ago. And it's not just the process of maturation. There's that as, of course, that's, that's, that's part of it. But on, on, a, on, a, on a much more basic level, in terms of our molecular uh, breakdown and, and atomic structure, we're not the same people. So that also lends credence to the, uh, this idea that we don't have uh, free will, that um, we are essentially constantly uh, changing. Now, the brain, too, uh, changes as well. But to say you have free will, to say that you are free to choose one thing or the other, is to say that you are essentially lie, lie outside a lot of uh, a chain of a causal chain of events that uh, can have a as I discussed in the video a set of variables causal variables that can have an effect on your behavioral outcomes but I mean what does that really mean now if you're a person of normal health and, and uh, stature I guess that's uh, on face value it's, that seems to make sense that you're free to choose but what about someone who has brain deficiencies? I mean, I'll give another example. Language. Language is, is a lot of people find, find it really boring, but the fact is we wouldn't be human beings without language. And because of that, language is sort of the defining human characteristic. Now, there are different kinds of language disorders. Um, apraxia, aphasia, they, I mean, I'm not going to go into the boring details, but they affect your ability to speak, perceive, and, and read words. And we know when people have damage done to certain areas of the brain, say within the temporal lobe, and the temporal lobe is, uh, you know, there are four lobes. It's, uh, in this, it's, it's part of the cerebral hemisphere, and it's primarily responsible for that kind of stuff, the auditor auditory, visual memories, language, hearing, speech. Uh, things like that. And there's a particular area called uh, Vernix area, uh, or Wernix, sorry, Wernix area, that is really the, the center of, of understanding spoken language. You know? And there, there are other areas. I mean, there are the Broca's uh, occipital lobe within the occipital lobe and, and so on and so forth. But if any of these areas sustain damage, uh, some people will uh, not will no longer be able to produce speech or understand speech or both or read or write. Uh, now, what does that mean to say you're free to choose that you have free will? A person with damage to Vernix area, Wernix area, or Broca's area that has some kind of speech defect uh, is he free to speak? What happened there? There was damage done to a specific area of his brain and now he can't speak anymore, or he can only speak partially, or he can't de decode other people's speech, and so on and so forth. So that raises the question, is he, was, is he free to choose to speak or not? Apparently not, since he in some capacity has lost either that, uh, that ability to speak or to understand or both. So he, a choice has been eliminated. Now you can say he's still free to choose XYZ, I guess, but the fact that damage done to a physical organ, his brain, has eliminated his ability to participate in what is the defining uh, and sort of salient quality of being a human being is very suggestive, if not almost hard evidence, that uh, we do not choose uh, we don't choose things. That we are we are in fact products of external causes and internal causes that we are not aware of. Uh, so to, to say that we, we can choose, there, we have free will to do what we want to do is also to sim simultaneously say that um, a, a man with damage to both Wernick's area and Broca's area in, um, in the brain who has totally jarbled and garbled and, and just messed up speech and can't understand other people's speech, that he's still free he's free to choose that or not, but clearly he's not. Um, so everything we do um, is subject to a scores of physical processes that we are not aware of. 
um, the man who sustained brain damage to, say, Broca's or Wernick's area, he that happened to him. Let's say he was in a car accident, someone rammed him, who knows? He's lost choice due to external causes, but even, I mean, there's, there, there's automatic motor function, but put it this way, um, there, there, there are states of physical being that you have really no control over. Let's say you're crossing the street and you have a very close call with, uh, with, with, a, with a hit and run driver, potentially could have, I mean, you're, you're just, you know, he shears off a bit of, uh, a bit of your skin in the process and you jump back and you're just pumped up, filled with adrenaline and, and you're just, your head is moving back and forth and back and forth. And it's such a close call that you're just thinking about the whole day. You go to work and you can't really concentrate because you thought, shit, I could have lost my life today. It was that close. So that physical event outside of your control has set in motion uh, a series of physical processes in your body's pumping out tons of noradrenaline, um, uh, heightened sense of awareness. Um, you can't suppress the thought, at least for the rest of the day, that you could have been killed. All these things that are going on, which will have an effect on your behavioral outcome. For example, maybe you work a hard job in an office that requires a lot of attention to detail, and, and that's just preoccupying you, and you can't do it. Uh, you, you, you can say, well, he's, you're free to choose that, but a person who's in that state of mind, due to, say, a near-death a near death experience, I don't mean of that sort, but of he's almost, he almost was killed, uh, will not be able to concentrate in many cases, or in this particular case. Someone with a different genetic makeup might well be able to do so, but in, in the case of a person with a certain set of genes, uh, a certain environment that he grew up in, maybe he, he wouldn't. Is that person free to choose to concentrate, to ignore his, his, his almost being killed in the morning on the way to work. Uh, this should seem a non sequitur that that idea, at least that kind of free will doesn't exist. We're constantly subject to and exposed to external forces that have an, uh, a profound effect on, on, on us. And then us, that is we, we are, we are simply the sum of many, many physical processes and the comp and and components that are that are engaging or, or bringing uh, engage in these processes, uh, that is what we are as as animals, all animals in that way. Now we happen to have higher cognitive functions than most animals, it appears, um, and I think that's what lends itself to this idea of a, of an eye. You know, even though this eye is is completely mutable. I mean, like I said, a couple of years ago, that wasn't you, not on an atomic or molecular level. Um, you know, so, and consequently, uh, you know, the brain is, is, is the neuroplasticity is well documented. I mean, they're, they're the constant additions being added, but, but all things being equal, once again, I mean, if you have an itch on your leg, and it's easily easily accessible by both your right or left hand. You happen to use your you know your right hand. You can't really account for why you decided to use your right hand. If you had free will, if you were aware of all the things you're doing, uh, you could say I chose my right hand because blah 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 and so on and so forth. That's not how human motor function works, and ultimately that's not even how our thought processes work. In, uh, in complex thought, we're affected by external causes, which then bring about a series of processes in the brain uh, that can affect you know, what you do. Um, so the the illusion of choice is is it's, is understandable, but it's clearly not there. Now uh, that probably was pretty boring to a lot of people, but uh, regardless, it is what it is. So you have that, uh, and once again, I'll probably go back to the brain, uh, but so you have this illusion of, of choice. Now, uh, once again, I'll, I, I should, the, people are gonna obviously, they're always gonna be skeptics about this, but I assure you that if you had damage to Wernick's area or Broca's area, that you would have some speech defects, some serious ones possibly. Let's hope not, I, you know, knock on wood, no one wants that. Um, would you still be free to choose to write things? The comments saying, well, determinism is this or that. Uh, no, you wouldn't, because in some cases, depending on what specific area of Warnick's area, Broca's area that was da damaged, you wouldn't even be able to write words anymore. 
do you are you choosing not to write words i mean so what it really boils down to is not some people just flat out don't understand this argument it seems others i think understand it but dismiss it because of a classic a classic counter argument which is a utilitarian argument you know utilitarian arguments are very common and they're very popular and they are so for understandable reasons but they're not they're not good logic they're not good uh, modes of argumentation so if someone says for example you know things can't be deterministic because then people would go around running and killing and whatever uh, whether that's true or not is another question but that doesn't have any effect on whether or not the universe and consequently living creatures uh, fall the universe is deterministic and consequently living creatures including human beings um, are subject to prob probabilistic behavior uh, behavioral patterns as I said you know, determinism is basically just probabilistic uh, interpretations if you want to look at it as an interpretation of, of, of human behavior that's well documented um, so that is not an argument to say that or it is an argument it's not a very good one to say that you know if people believe this then everything would be for nothing and blah 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 and you'll hear this argument often from religionists so if someone were to say to, to Stardust to me say Stardust uh, your belief in Thor is incorrect I say but no but Thor you know blots out the uh, the infernal orb of the, of the fiery orb of the Sun and brings us rain cool rain and and cloudy weather and he makes me feel good and then this person said well Stardust but Thor still doesn't exist no no and I say no 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 he has to exist because you know I can't live without him uh, now so but see my argument there is not a good one because I'm just saying well, he makes me feel good but that's not an argument for the existence of Thor any more than saying that people will do XYZ if determine if if we if we actually are uh, without free will and we live in a deterministic universe I mean that that's that's not relevant to the argument whatsoever um, it's only relevant as much as we might there might be some element of human beings such that we have to pretend that we are in charge and pretend that we have choice um, it's it just seems so patently obvious though when you just think about the range of, of differences in human beings so for example uh, Olympic sprinters many of whom hail from Jamaica have a, a certain gene uh, that gives them many many more fast twitch that is white muscle fibers particularly in the quadriceps area which allows them to excel I think something like 70 to 75 percent of them have that in uh, in sprinting that I presume I don't have I don't have that and most of you probably don't have maybe some of you do so can we could we say we could choose to be that could we choose to be an Olympic sprinter without the requisite genetics do you choose to have your genes uh, I mean, these are all relevant questions because when we're honest about these things we realize that there really isn't a lot of choice not in the conventional sense that doesn't mean we as Sam Harris said that we can we just stop doing stuff I mean we just kind of lie down and just uh, that, that in itself is a choice as he says right? that's a choice um, but what's important here is that we try to be intellectually honest about this now uh, and, and the point of that video in large measure more than anything else was to just show that these kind of behavioral trajectories that we're on uh, are predictable given certain environments so you know what happens when the Montreal police force goes on strike you know what happens if a certain group of people are you know exposed to a certain kind of war and you have certain you know cultural memes in place and this and that a lot of these things are, 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 are predictable and what happens to women when you know certain when a social social safety nets aren't involved you know what kind of labor and job choices they make and things like that I mean these are these are probabilistic outcomes based on external circumstances and, and, and causal links that really have nothing to do with the individuals um, that that's basically what I mean say for example by evolutionary autopilot 
these things these, fo these, things, these things follow a certain trajectory. Uh, you know, this this idea that you can sort of just will yourself to do certain things. Most of us don't even have an explanation. I mean, for example, we've all procrastinated. In fact, I'm a high mass, high lord of procrastination. But most of us don't know then when we finally decide to do things. Uh, you know, why didn't I do it 1.3 hours earlier? There's no you didn't, but you can't and but you can't account for that. Or why did I decide not to procrastinate today? Well, you could come up with all kinds of uh, reasons. And, and then say, I chose to do it because, oh, I didn't want to delay things. I need to get to the post office on time. Okay, but uh, I'm sure you've had days when, you know, you postponed that and there was no particular reason why, but you can't explain that either. So uh, the free will argument is, is, well, it doesn't really, there's no evidence to, to support it. More importantly, it's not really... Uh, it's not really relevant because it does seem like on some level we need to pretend uh, um, about these things. We need to pretend that we have control. A lot of this is human anxiety, right? Uh, it's the religion, reason why a lot of religionists cling to their respective deities. Uh, it's the reason why, I mean, <laughs> now we're getting into other fields, topics, but I think humans men and women suffer from a cosmic aloneness, not loneliness, but aloneness, the recognition that they are alone in the universe. And that is true. Um, it's true on the deepest level. You know, consciousness, even though it's completely um, borne out by physical processes in the brain, nonetheless is there. And your consciousness is separated from my consciousness. And uh, my consciousness is separate from that person, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think people recognize that and feel that um, and this generates a kind of, and this is just my supposition here, I'm going to, away from sort of more scientifically proven stuff to my own interpretations and supposition here, but uh, this idea that, you know, we're alone, not, not loneliness, loneliness is a, is a feeling rather than a state, right? We were, were in a state of, 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 of alonehood, if you will, and it's ineluctable, right? I mean, we're, we can't escape it, and that ineluctability uh, lends itself very well to such a thought as, you know, we have choice and free will and we're in control. People want to feel like they're in control of their own destiny, even though there's so little evidence to suggest that they in fact are. Uh, and in particular, I think this is where a lot of this, uh, well, going back to the, to the love meme, um, you know, people have to deal with the state of, of, of aloneness and they don't want to. Uh, I think love in lieu of religion or in lieu of other things that alternatively could be appealed to serves as a kind of uh, ersatz uh, religion, essentially, a kind of faux religion. People can, and everyone latches on to it. I used to, too. I think we all did uh, in our earlier days believe in the religion of love because. You know, that somehow assuages that feeling of sort of cosmic aloneness, not loneliness. I mean, loneliness is is a symptom of it, but that's not um, that's not what that actually is. Um, so, uh, drift in other territory here, but th that's part of it. I think, and, and I, I think that's where a lot of as well this, this sort of human idealism stems from. This idea that you know we're special and you know, we can we can change the world and ourselves and you know no one's no one's made the claim that change isn't possible, um, but in terms of prob probabilistic trajectory is that people are willing to embark on the likelihood of certain outcomes is far far slimmer than other outcomes because yeah once again deterministic universe we follows that uh, we follow certain trajectories more readily than others. Um, so the, or more, more simply put, uh, I mean, so for example, as a, a going your own way, that might be a trajectory that, that is, um, you know, I'm not saying there's a gene for that, but a sort of you as an individual who's decided to go your own way is uh, responsive in such a way that you can do that, whereas many men can't. 
um, for all sorts of reasons, you know, environmental, genetic, uh, all these other things. But you can do that. And but that's still reactive. That's not uh, that's not adaptive. I mean, you're, you're simply reacting to certain circumstances. Um, you haven't grown wings and you can't fly and uh, you haven't discovered uh, how to we uh, to, you know, and inseminate the air. Or any of these things that I mean, that's totally absurd, but any of these things that would be really be so some kind of adaptive really outside the spectrum of, of just sort of pure reaction. So, no, I think uh, I think we do follow certain trajectories, and uh, this idealism is is a, a serious uh, problem um, in in human beings because it affects our ability to think clearly about things. It gives us, say, the I think ultimately it, it helps support the illusion of free will, this idea that we're in charge constantly and we we make choices, and. Um, I mean, you, you, like I said, that doesn't take a lot of thought to to be refuted. Just think about anyone who who's subject to uh, you know a long causal chain of events outside their control. You know, someone who was abused as a child, sex, sexually abused as a child, and you know, got beaten, and, and so on and so forth. That per, that's going to have a, a profoundly different outcome on different people depending on their genetic composition. And you can't say that that particular outcome for say person A which is different to, say, person B, uh, he chose that outcome. Um, but, of course, then you say, he, ch you know, you can choose how to deal with it. Well, that's only only partially true because, I mean, there's epigenetics as well, so he has his genetic base, and then you have the epigenetic influences, so that, too, will be limited, uh, you know. And then maybe that add into when, when it ceased and when it started, and, I mean, it's just this long chain of, causal events outside of your control. So it just it should be obvious that this is just a, a no-brainer. But the problem, my real problem, I think, is it's not, not that we don't have free will. It's that we're just sort of um, saddled with, with idealism about the human condition. Uh, and part of that's been beneficial. I mean, it's the desire to, to create, to invent, to be the discoverer, if you will, to trailblaze, basically, I mean, that, that's part of it. But the, the 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 negative of that, the negative side of that, is this 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 belief that we're special, um, that our feelings are special, and and that our feelings say that the feelings of love, the biochemistry of love, that that somehow has an almost mystic quality um, to it. And then you add that into the equation of sort of the cosmic alone aloneness that we all face. And that can be uh, quite daunting to to overcome, but I think that's all well and good. And so people might be asking me, or have asked me in the past, "Well, you know, you're so negative, you know, you're you're just saying nothing can change, you're, you're not doing shit." And, uh, okay, fair enough. Um, my argument against that is simply that you know, we, we can do things, but we we can we can never be as effective. In doing things, uh, in affecting change, if you want to call it that, if we're intellectually dishonest with ourselves, others, and the world, um, you know, if we adhere to say the mystic love bond, if we adhere to fallacious ideas that of of the self, of of I, of of you know free will, if we you know, if, if, let's have an honest. Uh, I mean, this will never happen, especially not in the so-called manosphere, but let's have an honest discussion of the state of humanity, uh, the way humanity that is Homo sapiens actually is, not of, uh, not uh, befuddled by idealism and not uh, saddled with uh, wishful thinking, uh, not using utilitarian arguments that, you know, if this is so, then you know, we, we, so we can't have that. No, just uh, let's just do that at some point in time. Now, I don't think that's ever going to happen because, <laughs> once again, human beings follow probabilistic trajectories on things. And because of that, uh, it's highly unlikely that humans are really going to uh, turn around, in, in a majority at least, and start practicing intellectual honesty. I just don't see that happening. Uh, but... Yeah, it's that's I guess my wishful thinking. Well, I don't think it's going to happen, so it's not wishful thinking. But, but as anyways, to the point of this is that that's ideal, ideally what I would like to see, if ever. But um, no, I mean that's unlikely to happen. So you know, you take uh, you, you 
You just deal with things as they are. Um, but, you know, uh, basically, as I've said many, many times, unless we under, under examine the, the underlying fundamentals of everything, you know, uh, that is the biology, literally the physics behind it all, you know, our origins, political arguments are kind of wasting time and Paul, it's all just, um, you know, twiddling thumbs, essentially, it's not, not very useful. Anyway, uh, I think I've talked enough about this. Uh, I'm not trying to prove anything to anyone. I just thought this is an interesting topic and, um, you know, there you go. So yeah. anyway, take care. Bye-bye.